All right, I'm going to do a quick book review here of this book right here, The House Church Movement. I'll show you here on the overhead camera. The House Church Movement by David Cloud, Issues Facing the Churches. So we're going to do a review of this book here. I'm going to go through and show you some of the things that I've highlighted, make some points as we go through this. All right, so we'll start out here. Uh, All right, let me zoom in. Whoop, I need to get my remote. He says here, this is page 9, It must be remembered that the vast majority of the leaders of the house church movement are not separatists. Most are ecumenical to some degree. They believe in affiliation, not separatism. They might disagree with one another, but generally they don't, they don't reprove one another or separate from one another. All right, now, the basic premise of David Cloud's book is that there are some really rotten people out there in the house church movement, and they basically represent most of the movement. Um, that would be like me condemning all Babel buildings because of Rick Warren or Joel Olstein. I don't need those guys to condemn Babel buildings. Okay, The church building movement only goes back a few hundred years. Right? Bible believers did not meet in church buildings before then. You say, well, there's not much you know, in it about history. Well, we do know what the Bible says, and we do know when the church building movement started. For the independent Baptists in America, it started about 1700. I've talked about, in the, talked about that in the independent fundamental Baptist Catholicism studies. All right, And my problem with it, just to, just to reiterate this whole thing of the Babel building system, the building a, a building and calling it a church, my main problem with it is, that it creates a double standard, a double life, whereby you act a certain way when you are in church and you act a different way when you are not in church. And what it confuses is the fact that a Christian is in the body of Christ all the time. You are in church all the time. See? And so you go off to this building and you associate it with this holy place and this holy temple and everything else, and now you become tied to it. You go there, you start to become very, very anemic. And it makes all kinds of problems. Again, I've talked about that in many of my other studies. So I'm not going to get into a whole big thing on it here. All right. But to categorize all house churches, you know, with this statement right here, um, I've been in the house church movement now for a while. And I know a lot of other brethren have been too. And they're very strong Bible-believing Christians. And we are soul winning. And we do... You know, believe in the teachings of the New Testament. We are not like these liberal people that come out and try to usurp the house church movement. All right. So the basic premise of the whole book is wrong in that condemning books, and I'm going to show you the one here because I have read it, and it is filled with satanic heresy. I'll tell you that right now. Um, Pagan Christianity by Frank Viola. I do not believe for one second that Frank Viola is a saved man. There's the book. I do have some books or some pages marked there and everything. Um, I think his system is nutty, charismatic uh, foolishness. Uh, very, very much new age, very much. And, and David Cloud brings a lot of this stuff out in his book, and, and I agree with those things, that where Frank Viola is really messed up, okay, fine. But that doesn't do away with a lot of the points that he brought up in this book. And I'm not recommending you go and get this book, believe me. There's just too much heresy in it. But the point is, he brings up some things in here that David Cloud never answered in his book and isn't about to answer because it threatens his system, the system of the Babel building. And I call them Babel buildings too, by the way, because that's most of what goes on there. People babble. They're social clubs. That's what they are. Okay? I was raised in them. I went to them for years and years and years. I've preached in the pulpits. I've talked to the pastors. I've gone to all these places. And I'm not a church jumper either. Okay, that gets put on house church Christians in here. Oh, it's all disgruntled people and stuff like that. I'm going to show you as we continue here. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you right now. Motivations for the house church movement. There are many reasons why the house church movement is growing. One is apostasy and compromise. Now, see, I agree with that as long as we're talking about the apostasy and compromise being happening in the Babel buildings. Because there are those of us that refuse to compromise the truths of God's Word, the King James Bible, and we go to these Babel buildings and we see the hirelings up there. They just want to get a paycheck. 
They don't talk about things that are controversial. They aren't willing to ruffle feathers. They'll never condemn the Catholic Church. They'll never name the Catholic Church. All kinds of stuff like that. And we go and we meet with them and we talk to them and we say, you really should be, you know, why don't you talk about this? And what, you know, what's going on here? Oh, well, you know, you're just kind of nuts and crazy. What am I supposed to do? Keep going? Well, according to some of the Babel building advocates, yes. Just go and keep my mouth shut, even though they're spewing lies from the pulpit. Again, another problem that a lot of the people in the Babel building movement have is they assume because their little church there is good, then there's a good church in every community out there. And they say, well, if there's not one in your, in your community, then move. Oh, yeah, that's real scriptural. I mean, you see that in the New Testament. You know, moving, all the Christians had to move to Antioch to be in good fellowship locally. No, no, they're supposed to stay in their areas there and evangelize the lost. How can you carry out the Great Commission if everybody is being moved to little centers of, of good, strong Christianity, local churches in the area? No. Christians need to stay in the areas where God has them. We need to be spread out as the body of Christ, not get all clumped together. Again, I've talked about that in other studies. But let's continue here. He says here, the typical house church approach is not the answer to these problems. Yes, it is. Yes, it absolutely is, because it's going back to the New Testament way, which I've talked about in many of my studies. Another rap reason for the rapid growth of the house church is the Rapid growth of the house church is the me generation rebellion toward authority. Okay, what is the authority that we are supposed to submit ourselves to? You say the preacher, the man of God in the local community, the local church. You're man of God, the preacher. Um, okay, well, how long are we supposed to do that? As Christians, how long are you supposed to be submissive to the pastor? If you want to go with that. No, the fact of the matter is you're supposed to submit yourself to the written written uh, scripture right here, the written word of God. It's going to say the written record, the written scripture. Okay, this is where you're supposed to submit yourself. This is the authority. This is what we have. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know, right there, King James Bible. Now, what happens if your pastor isn't lining up with the pages of the King James Bible? What do you do? Submit yourself to the authority of the man or to the book? What do you do? And again, like I said, I mean, what, what is the point of, you know, okay, let's go and, and we're under local church pastors and stuff like that. And I'm not against the position of elders, by the way. I'm totally for the position of elders. I think that there should be older men that are teaching the younger people. I, I believe totally in that. The Bible says that. Okay, so I'm not trying to say that there's no such thing in Scripture as elders. All right, I don't, I don't say that. But what I'm saying is to say that you should just go and you should be part of a local congregation and you just keep going there your whole life and you never become a man, you never grow up, you never learn the Bible well enough that you can go out and minister to the lost on your own. You always have to be there under your pastor's headship, spiritual protection and stuff like this. Hello? That's Catholic. That's why I talk about independent fundamental Baptist Catholicism because that's what is mostly practiced in these Baptist Babel buildings. I've been there. I've seen it. But let's continue. Next we have page 15. He says, I am not talking about adapting contemporary programs and philosophies that are contrary to Scripture. We must definitely remain within the box of Scripture. Okay, and we talk about, he talks about this through the thing, you know, where are church buildings at? Buildings that they call churches, where are they at in the New Testament? They're not there. Now we're going to see his philosophy behind this as we continue. We Baptists say the Bible is the sole authority for faith and practice, but all too often we fight for things that are mere human traditions. Then he goes into things, youth ministry, Sunday school programs, vacation Bible school, Bible colleges. So he's admitting here that these are just human traditions. Okay, when you are coming out and you're saying we, we are Bible believing in all matters of faith and, and practice, then it should line up here, King James Bible. 
And it's interesting because he says this here, but then he goes on later to say, well, just because it doesn't you know, talk about it specifically by name, it's still okay. Well, then you're not a Bible-believing Christian. You are not, your, your standards are not based, based on the, in the Bible for all matters of faith and practice. You are adding human traditions. Here he says, the Bible says nothing one way or the other about Sunday school or VBS or a children's ministry or a youth ministry or a senior's ministry or a college and career ministry. Okay, um, yes it does. Right? And I have a whole study on that. The thing about Sunday school and VBS or children's ministries. Um, nowhere in Scripture does it say that anybody but a parent is supposed to teach the children. Not one verse. And I can show you scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture that the parents are the ones that are to train up the children. Not anybody else. And you say, well, Brian, I don't think it's a big deal. I don't think it's a really big deal. Oh, well, uh, then uh, I hate to tell you, but a lot of people in Sunday schools will tell you much differently. Okay? And, and again, I've talked about this in other studies. I mean, you know, some of the experiences I had growing up in Sunday school, I had a Sunday school teacher punch me the one time, you know, and, and stuff, because I talked to a guy sitting beside me, comes up and punches me. You know, he wouldn't have done that if my dad was standing there, guarantee you that. You know, and my dad was a, was a, a big shot in the Babel building that that was part of, you know. See, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on. There were kids that were bringing up all kinds of sexually explicit types of things and stuff in Sunday school. There was all kinds of programs that were just worldly and wicked in Sunday school. And it was an independent Bible church, by the way. I wasn't raised Catholic or Lutheran or something like that. It was supposed to be in a conservative Bible church. People wore suits and ties. The women wore nice dresses when I was growing up. Of course, it's worldly now, as they all get worldly over time. But, uh, you know, and there are so many stories, nightmare stories. I mean, there was an independent fundamental Baptist church not too far from where I used to live in Pennsylvania. Myerstown Baptist Church, it was called. And one of the Sunday school teachers was the son-in-law of the pastor. And he got caught driving around to fast food restaurants with his pants down. This guy's teaching children in Sunday school. But it's good, you know, because there are some good ones out there that overrules the bad ones, right? Sure it does. Continuing, Sunday school is neither scriptural nor unscriptural. Yes, it is unscriptural. It's totally unscriptural, you know. And again, I've talked about that in my other study. I'm not going to go into it here. Watch the other sermon on that for more information. There's absolutely nothing in Scripture that forbids churches from teaching them. Yes, there is. Absolutely there is. No one but a parent should teach the children. All right. Again, what's the responsibility for the parents? How many parents drop their kids off at the local church because they want some time for themselves? And they don't want the responsibilities of raising their children themselves. Because you see, when you're a parent and you're raising your child yourself, if your child gets messed up, there's only one person that you can blame. Yourself. But if you have Sunday school and public school and everything else and your children get messed up, you say, well, it wasn't me. It was those people over there. So you're shirking your responsibilities as a parent when you're letting other people raise your children. According to the King James Bible. Okay, not according to my beliefs or opinions. According to, my, according to this King James Bible, it says that the parent is supposed to instruct. The father, the mother are supposed to instruct the child and you say, what about it and over there in the book of Titus where it talks about the older women are to instruct her, the younger women and stuff like this? Because I've heard that one. Let's look that up real quick. This is just going to be a quick study too, by the way. I don't even have notes on this one. I just, again, it's another one I need to get done. Titus chapter 2. The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the younger the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Why don't you have the older ladies teaching the children of the younger ladies? Because that's not the Bible system. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Young women are to be keepers at home, bearing children, guiding the house. How do you guide the house? Sending your kids off to somebody else to raise them? Sending your kids off to somebody else to teach them about the Bible? 
That's your job. If God has given you children, ladies out there, it's your job to raise them. You say, well, that's going to make some financial difficulties for us and, and some hardships and things. Yeah, yeah, doing things the right way is more difficult. But let's continue. In fact, the churches have a commission from Christ to teach everyone. Oh, really? Chapter and verse? Where does the Bible say to go out, where to go out and teach everyone? We're going to see about this in a little bit here. Thus, it is not only the job of parents to teach children and youth, it is also the job of the churches. Ha, okay. And if they decide to do this through a Sunday school or a biblically operated youth ministry of some sort, biblically operated. What does that mean? Biblically operated. It's not in Scripture, but it's biblically operated. No one can take the Bible and say this is wrong, and no one can therefore rightly condemn it. I just did. I have in my other study. It's the mother's responsibility to guide the house. And the father is supposed to be there to teach the children. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Not the Sunday school. Not a bunch of other people out there that are part of the church. Anyhow, he says here, Their integrated philosophy has bound them in a legalistic trap which actually hinders the fulfillment of the commission. Sure it does. Uh, children need Bible truth taught at their own level of understanding, oh boy, and from their unique perspective, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with a church operating a Sunday school or whatever to do this. Guarantee you, yes, there is. Because I've been in the children's ministry type of thing. I used to teach children. And I know it's all the fun. Let's, let's do it, you know, and make, and make it exciting for them and games and candy if you say your verse is right and everything because you got to keep them interested, you know, got to keep the bus kids coming in and all this stuff. And I've seen the fruit of, of that whole thing too. They get older and they want nothing at all to do with the Lord or the Bible or anything else. Down here he says, And what about all the children and youth in the community that don't have the advantage of living in a godly home? What is that family, house, church, or the integrated church doing for them? Well, witnessing to the parents is what you should do. Instead of going and trying to lure their children away with candy. Page 18, you know, and a lot of this stuff, you know, we got to get them in so we can get tell them the gospel and stuff like this. Yeah. A lot of these kids are coming in, they're doing whatever they have to do to get more candy. And they think to themselves, if I pray a prayer of salvation, I'm going to get more candy. And, I, you know, if I can learn these Bible verses better and stuff, I'll get more candy. And I'll get more points and I'll get more this and I'll get more that. That's exactly what goes on. Page 18, he says, someone might say that the church families could teach them. But the church can also teach them. In fact, in light of Christ's commission, the church must teach them. Huh? The church is the people. It's not the building. Right? And you say, well, but, but yeah, that's what we're talking about. But down here he says church families. Up here he's saying the church. Aren't the church families the church? See, he's making a difference between the two. Returning to the theme of soul liberty, meaning things not specifically forbidden in Scripture, and to the issue of practicality, most of the things we do in church services fall into this realm. Well, at least he admits that they're not in Scripture. All right? At least he admits that. But let's continue. Page 20, he says here, At the same time, church, church traditions are not wrong in themselves as long as they are not contrary to the clear teaching of God's Word. Now we're going to see this all throughout this book. Capitalizing the W on the Word of God. And we're going to see that this is actually purposefully done to be deceptive. I'm going to show you that. This is one thing that these apostates will do. They will say the Word of God, the capital W, and then they'll say that this is the standard here. Well, if this is the standard, then you would know that the written Word of God is always a lowercase w. There are only seven references in the King James Bible to a capital W Word of God, and it's Jesus Christ, the manifest Word of God. And you say, well, Ryan, don't make such a big point. You're going to see later why I make this point. He slips up in here. Okay, 
You're going to see it. A challenge about starting new churches. He says here, the house church movement can be a challenge to churches to be aggressive in starting new churches. All right. The church is the discipleship center, the pe preacher teacher training center, the headquarters for world missions. So churches must start churches. Okay. Um, what do you mean by that? Churches must start churches. We should continue to build other buildings and get ourselves in debt to the banks and 501c3 under the IRS codes so that they control your speech. You know? Are we talking about people or are we talking about buildings, in other words? Over here on the next page, page 21, he says, in a sense, we do not, or we do need a new form of church that can be fruitful and multiply, but it is not a house church, so to speak. <laughs> Why not? Were they fruitful and multiplying in the first century? When they didn't have Babel buildings? Oh, yes, I think so. Yeah, sure. Um, then why would we get ourselves in debt? Go out and get mortgages, half a million dollar mortgages, so we can have a building to worship in. How much growth do you think you're going to be doing spiritually when you owe $500,000 to the bank? Why don't you spend the money on tracts and Bibles instead? meet in homes and go out there to the lost and witness to the lost and you get somebody saved and then you go and you meet in their house. Take a couple of the elders over and you teach them the Bible. And then after that, then you can go and you can, let's come over here and you can meet and fellowship with these brothers and sisters here and you can kind of organize and things. Let's go out and do some tracting. Let's go out and do this. Let's go out and do that. Go back to the first century practices. You'd see spiritual growth. Um, down here he says a challenge to be innovative in evangelism even though not everything they do is biblically legitimate. Okay? Talking about the house church movement again. Not everything they do is biblically legitimate. Okay? Over here he says, the emerging element of the house church movement, which is very large, is willing to do all this and more. Talking about worldly things up in here and stuff like this. And like I said before, so do the Babel buildings. The Babel buildings do all kinds of worldly things to bring people in. Again, can you condemn all Babel buildings based on what most of them are doing right now? Well, in the sense of being worldly and stuff like that and using, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see here, bikini beach parties or prancing around in modest ballet uniforms or loving the same raunchy music in R-rated movies as the unsaved as you commune with them about the latest iTunes offerings or Hollywood garbage. Do IFB Babel buildings do that? Well, I imagine that there's some that don't, but I know a lot that do. Sure, there's a lot that do. So then we can condemn all of them based on the ones that are bad. You say, well, that's not fair. Was well, it fair to condemn all house churches because of a bunch of liberals like this? No, it is not. I find this interesting here, too, what he says. <clears throat> page uh, 24, he says, Jesus was a friend of sinners. All right? The fact is that Jesus was a friend of sinners. You know the interesting thing about that? Jesus never said that. Jesus never said, I am a friend of sinners. You know who said that? The Pharisees. Jesus said about, you know, the Pharisees say about me that I'm a friend of sinners and, and wine bibbers and, a, you know, I'm a wine bibber and, and all this other stuff. Jesus Christ never said that he was a friend of sinners. <clears throat> you say, well, was Jesus a friend of sinners? Well, in the sense of telling them that they need to repent. He came and he said, you know, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So in that sense, yes, he was their friend, but not in the sense of buddy-buddy with them and evangelizing them that way. No, he was not. <clears throat> um... Consider the following statements made by house church leaders. He says here, We spend so much time building nice barns with padded pews, air-conditioned halls, and state-of-the-art sound systems, yet we have neglected the fields. We are so foolish. We are as foolish as the farmer who builds a barn and then stands in the doorway calling all the crops to come in and make themselves at home. It is time for the church to get their hands dirty in the soil of lost people's lives. The Great Commission is not a take-it-or-leave-it option for Christians. Many of us live in self-made Christian ghettos, 
never developing meaningful relationships with unbelievers. We believe that friendship with people in the world will somehow contaminate us. We avoid relationships of any depth with people outside the church and often are so busy with Christian activities that we <clears throat> have no time for others. It gets to the stage where we don't know how to relate with non-Christians other than inviting them to a meeting. Both very true statements here, by the way. He says, um, <clears throat> by no means do we recommend blah, 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 these guys' writings, but they and their house church friends are right in this matter, at least as a general principle. <laughs> Come on, man. You know, they're right, but just as a general principle. Just can't get, little, can't get rid of that Babel building, you know. Just have to hold on to that thing. Um, here he talks about having people over for meals and games, you know, as a way to evangelize them. Uh, trying to reach every segment of society. Again, I disagree with this word right there. You shouldn't be using that. It's not the Bible word. The King James Bible word is sodomite. You ought to stick to Bible terminology. <clears throat> Here it says, He didn't just invite these people to church and wait in vain for them to come in. He took church to them. Okay. Uh, you know, there again, isn't that kind of what house church people do? Uh, and then he over here, he says, I invite the people to gospel meetings. I wear your couple hundred thousand dollar building. Um, here he's talking about this uh, couple that they did this this whole thing about um, getting worldly and things because they had a TV come in and uh, you know they had a television and stuff like that and they were really getting worldly and it kind of messed them up. You say, where would they get the idea to have a television? Well, according to this paragraph right here, they seek entertainment from worldly influences in our church. Wait a second. You should have a. You should go to a church someplace, but there's a good chance you're going to get messed up there from worldly influences. You know. So he says that they got rid of this television thing, and then their their family got back on fire for the Lord and all this other stuff. And here he says about you know they had people over, and uh, sometimes they we watch a creation science DVD or a good Christian film with them. I have written up here, I thought they got rid of their TV. <laughs> so it's like, you know, we were influenced to get a television because of our people at our church, and then we got rid of it, but then a ways to evangelize lost, we got another television so we could watch videos with them. Just a few double standards there. Invite the people to a special Christmas cantata at our church. So you got to have your big building to put on the special Christmas cantatas there, you know. Sunday school teaching, and all but one has had the joy of leading at least one child to Christ through this. Two of our boys have been asked to preach not only at our church, but in others as well. I attribute this in part to my husband's in, husband encouraging them to memorize at least one of Spurgeon's sermons each year. Don't memorize the Bible, just memorize Spurgeon. And you know, his uh, tabernacle over there in London that's patterned after a Greek Parthenon. Exact same thing, you know. And it turns out that this whole story here that was written about keeping the kids, how to keep our children from falling prey to the world, it's David Cloud's own book. I'm not really going out to get much, you know, many other accounts there. Whatever. <laughs> Page 36, he says, they are in proper affiliation with a New Testament church and are submissive to pastoral authority. You know, oh boy, look out there. Proper affiliation with a New Testament church. Again, at one point he's saying, now, New Testament church, there's really nothing in there about having a building and Sunday school and vacation Bible school and all this other stuff. And then later on he says, but you better be in a New Testament church that has Sunday school and a, and a building and, and VBS. Isn't that kind of a double standard? And submissive to pastoral authority? Okay. Um, what if the pastor's not in line with the scriptures? What if the pastor's doing things that don't line up with the Bible? Do you chuck out the Bible and go with the pastor? I can guarantee you that's what a lot of the Baptists do. I've been there. I've seen it. Page 38. 
Many people will more readily attend an informal meeting in a home than a formal setting in a church building. But house churches are still wrong because they're not New Testament churches. Yeah. Down here he says, this is page 40. He says, Bible-believing church, we don't have to have house churches to find ways to make strangers feel welcome. <laughs> okay. More people feel better in informal house church settings, but we don't have to do it that way to make strangers feel welcome. All right. Next page, he says, there needs to be a plan to greet visitors as they approach or enter the church building. That's how you make people feel welcome, you know. Then rarely ever made me feel welcome, made me more creeped out when I went to those places. This has happened on many occasions when we have visited churches. In fact, I would say it is typical, you know, that no one talks to them and stuff like that. So you should be really outgoing and, and annoying and stuff like this. <laughs> Down here he says, while we reject the house church's principle against authoritative preaching and teaching... We are reminded of how important it is to give people the opportunity to ask questions. Again, you're assuming that all house church Christians, all house church groups that meet together, have no authoritative preaching and teaching. That's just simply not true, you know. And you know the fact that you can ask questions. I mean, even when we would, you know, when I was part of Bible Believers Fellowship, we would have preaching. And after the sermon, we'd sit around and we'd talk about the sermon, the, the sermon subject and, and talk about things and plan upcoming evangelistic types of things, going out, giving out tracts and putting out information and things. What should we do about the website? Should we this? Should we that? You know, whatever. Upcoming sermon ideas, you know, whatever. We had Bible study on Thursday nights and we would go through and we would go verse by verse, expository, the whole through, whole way through a, a book of the Bible. We'd pick, you know, Pauline epistles usually. And we'd go through and we'd discuss it. And people could enter in. You're not going to get that in a Babel building. At least not too many that I've ever been a part of. But it doesn't take a house church to do this. Yes, it does. You know, again, house churches, it's informal. You can come in. You can spend as much time as you want there. I mean, a lot of times, there were times we'd, we'd talk for hours. Hours and hours and hours. You know, you can't do that at a Babel building. So, you know, you got a schedule to keep. Man, we got to keep this thing moving here. We got to get out of here in a half hour. Now he says the agenda of the house church movement. And by the way, if it looks like I'm picking on him and stuff like that, if I'm looks like I'm picking on David Cloud here, I'm doing this for a reason. Because right now it's still kind of the, the fairly, you know, some of the double talk, somewhat innocent here. But as we get into this thing, he gets just downright nasty with the house church movement. So... I'm going to be nasty back because I stand for the authority of Scripture and he isn't lining up with Scripture. Here he says, but the house church movement has an agenda that extends far beyond this. We do discern a threefold agenda driven by a higher spiritual power. Oh, really? The house church movement is driven by a higher spiritual power. I wonder who that would be. Well, don't worry because he tells us later on. Down here he talks about end-time apostasy without a proper captain. Okay. Um, house churches, the agenda... Let me, let me just read the, the paragraph here. First, among the no-pastor or weak-pastor house churches, the agenda is to remove professing Christians from the protection of God-called, biblically-qualified pastors and to launch them into the treacherous waters of end-time apostasy without a proper captain. So a pastor is a captain? Oh, don't think too highly of yourself now, do you? Hmm, isn't that interesting? So in other words, a Christian is completely without hope if they don't have a good pastor. The Holy Spirit can't guide them, can't lead them. Really? And you say, well, then you're against all pastors. I didn't, I didn't say that. I didn't say I'm against the position of elders. I'm all for that. I think that that should be there. But let me tell you right now, there are a lot of people out there that have no option. There are a lot of people that have been out there. You know, and, and let's talk about the thing. Oh, you can get into the house church movement and then you get under bad spiritual leadership or weak, no pastor things. What about the people that go to the church buildings, the Babel buildings, and get messed up there? 
Why don't we talk about that there, David Cloud? Why don't we talk about the people? I mean, how do you think the most of the apostasy has come in here in these last days? Via the house church movement or the Babel buildings? How do these guys get their power? If you want to talk about a proper captain, why don't we talk about Rick Warren or Billy Graham or Joel Osteen or any of these other, Bill Hybels or any of these other you know, false prophets? How do they get their positions of power? By establishing house churches? No, they become the captain of huge congregations whereby they can amass huge fortunes and they can get huge power. That's how these guys do that. Billy Graham, of course, I don't, you know, he didn't have a Babel building per se, but he's going out and having all these big worldwide revivals and thousands of people coming to hear him talk. You aren't going to do that in a house church. You see, small groups of Christians with multiple elders, there's a guard there against apostasy. You say, well, there, there's like, you know, wicked people like this over here, Frank Viola and stuff like that. Yeah, but they're not even in the picture when it comes to Bible-believing house churches. Crazy. But let's continue. Down here he says, page 46, they abuse the original Greek and ignore the plain meaning of God's word. And right over here he says the Greek word for rule. I mean, he can't even wait till he gets over here to the next page before he starts going to Greek. Condemns it here. Abuse the original Greek and ignore the plain meaning of God's word. What is God's word, David Cloud? Is this God's word? Well, if it's God's word, it has to be perfect. You say, well, it can be God's word without being perfect. It's just a translation. It's a good translation, probably the best in English, but it's not perfect. So then you're saying that you are smart enough to correct this book, and yet it's still God's Word. What does that make you? That makes you higher than God. If God wrote the book, and you can show that there are places where it's an error, or could be translated better, then you're smarter than God. If this book is God's Word, then you have no right to question it or judge it. That's the issue. Page 48. In fact, a multi-headed body is a strange thing, and in strictly practical terms, it is more natural and reasonable that one man will have more authority than others. Uh, well, I don't agree with that. I used to. I used to believe in the one-man pastor system, but I've seen the abuse of that thing. I think that the biblical system is to have multiple elders. I think one man putting the, the power, you know, what do they say? Absolute power corrupts, or power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I've seen the dictatorial thing of pastors. And ironically, David Cloud's written about it. I'm going to be talking about this book later on, but he's written about it. The Jack Hiles effect, you know, or the Hiles effect, excuse me, the Hiles effect. Where all the power was invested in one man, a cultic dictator, and he ran people. Do you think that Jack Hiles would have ever gotten to his position of corruption? Do you think he would have ever gotten to that position of control over people if he had been a house church pastor? Multiple elders, a bunch of other guys that could judge him and tell him, hey, you're wrong. Would he have ever gotten to that position of prominence? No. So how did this apostasy, how did this wickedness take place? Through house churches or through a church building? I won't answer that question. You can answer it for yourself. <clears throat> Here he says, The saints are left to roam the jungles of end-time apostasy without proper protection. <laughs> so a man is a protection. I didn't happen to see that in Ephesians chapter 6. I don't remember where it said pastor is part of the armor that a Christian is supposed to have. You say, well, Brian, of course we're supposed to have our, our armor there, but what's that have to do? He just said protection. Right there in the book. Protection. A Christian that doesn't have a good preacher, he's without protection. I mean, the Lord can't do a thing for somebody like that. And how many times have I gotten comments from people? I don't even, I can't even keep track anymore. It's crazy. People saying to me, I was in, you know, going to church, you know, for 20, 30, 40 years, and I didn't learn anything. 
You know, I wanted to learn. I'd go to the pastor and say, hey, what about this? What about that? Well, we'll try to put together a sermon on that someday. But this week, you know, we're going to be talking about money and giving again for the fifth week in the row, you know, and stuff. We've all been there. But check this out. Here he says about the house church movement. It's an agenda to create the one world church. Second, the satanic agenda of the house church movement is to create the one world church. <laughs> huh. Wow. Isn't that something? So let me get this straight here, Cloudy. All of the Antichrist followers are going to be in disorganized house church secret meetings. That's the, going to be the one world church, huh? They're not going to be meeting and worshiping in public in the big, huge Babel buildings that have been constructed now over the last couple hundred years, worshiping the image of the beast on the big telescreens. That's not going to happen. It's going to be house churches. I can see it now. Everybody meeting secretly in their homes, worshiping the Antichrist. Huh? Are you kidding me? Page 50. This ecumenical agenda is helping to build the one world harlot church prophesied in scripture. Okay. Again, he quotes a bunch of liberal people that are into the house church movement. And he says, see, it's the one world church and they're going to build, you know, the, the, the one world harlot church prophesied in scripture. Wow. Well, what is the one world harlot church prophesied in scripture? Oh, uh, that would be Roman Catholicism and all of her daughters. Do you think that Roman Catholicism is going to give up their temples? I can see it now. I can see it. I, it's probably going to come out later this week that Pope Francis abandoned St. Peter's Basilica and now he's holding the Mass in people's homes in Italy. I can see it now. And the false prophet is going to be traveling in underground house churches. It's all coming true. Oh, come on, man. You talk about absurd. David Cloud, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. The house church movement is going to be the one world government church. The one world new world order church. Come on. That's one of the most idiotic things I've ever heard in my life. Up here again he says, an agenda to build the kingdom of God. Third, the satanic agenda of the house church movement is to build the kingdom of God. Satanic agenda. The way that they're doing it in the New Testament but it's satanic. You can't provide one verse of scripture that says that any Christian ever met any building that they called a church, and yet we are the Satanists for meeting in homes the way they did in the New Testament. It's absurd. Talk about a liar. You are a liar and a deceiver, David Cloud. Satanic agenda. Give me a break. You're pathetic. Page 53, let's continue reading this idiotic nonsense. He says here, the effect of the house church movement, at least a large percentage of it, is to stir up dissatisfaction with traditional New Testament churches. <laughs> yeah. And to lead people into the treacherous waters of apostasy. And the waters of the house church movement is treacherous indeed. Okay, let me ask you viewers out there. How many of you have learned more in, a, in your home listening to preaching, reading the Bible for yourself, how many of you have learned more there than in the Babel buildings that you attended for years and years and years? Don't tell me treacherous waters of apostasy. Give me a break. Continuing, again, we would remind our readers that not all house churches are guilty of these heresies. There are biblical churches that meet in houses that are not uh, moving with the flow of end-time apostasy, but those are in the extreme minority. Really? You know that? You've talked to them? You've talked to all the house church Christians out there that are in the extreme minority? I can tell you right now, the majority of the Satanism and apostasy that comes from these, you know, the, all the rock music and the, the, you know, like the CCM and all this other stuff, you know where it's being done at? Church buildings! 
buildings that they call churches. That's where the most of the apostasy and wickedness is going on. Not in people's homes. Give me a break. But now watch the lying and duplicity here. I mean, this is incredible. Page 56. Neo-Orthodoxy claims that the Bible itself is not infallible, that only Jesus is infallible. The Bible becomes the Word, see the capital W there, of God, only as we experience it as the Word of God. Prop, you know, he says there, this denies what the Bible says about itself, that it is propositionally the infallible Word of God, capital W. It's not really, it's just propositionally. Well, you ought to run for political office there, Cloud. Talking like that. But check this out. Scripture is the living, lowercase w, word of God. And apart from the actual lowercase w, words of the Bible, we are left with vain mysticism and the ultimate authority ceases to be God's revelation of himself in Scripture and instead becomes my instant intuition of the lowercase w word of God. You lying, stinking hypocrites, you. Why is it that up here you have capital W word of God when referring to the written word of God, but down here you drop down and you talk about the lowercase w? Well, maybe it was a typo. Maybe it was all just a big mistake. No, maybe you're lying to people. Maybe you are purposefully deceiving people because you see, you don't believe that this is the infallible, perfect Word of God, do you, David Cloud? You don't believe that this is the infallible Word of God because you see, that would put you into the King James only camp of the Ruckmanites and all the other things like all this other stuff. We're going to see about that later on too. But you know, that puts you over into the wacko camp. That gets you out of the scholars' union, doesn't it? Because you know, no translation can be inspired. Only the original autographs were inspired. And the original languages, well, we have good copies of those too and stuff, but we can't really be sure there either because after all, Erasmus had multiple editions and Stephanus and Biza and there were multiple editions of that in the, in the Hebrew and who can be really sure of, of how the word should be translated? And You see, I know about the Bible version issue. I've been talking about it for many, many years now. All right, And I understand that the reason a lot of these people don't want to say that this is the inspired and errant perfect Word of God is because then it makes you look foolish. And then you, you know, the, the enemies come out and they go, what about the 1611? Or is it the, which edition is it? The 1769 or the 1611? What about the words here? And what about this? One says ye, one says he. And you know, what about the differences between Cambridge and Oxford? And what about, what about, what about? Hey man, my standard is and always will be this book I hold in my hands is the written Word of God. Perfect, infallible, inerrant, inspired Word of God. I don't correct it, it corrects me. This is a holy book that I hold in my hands. Perfect in all matters of faith and practice. And if you don't believe that, then quit trying to play that you do. And quit trying to fool around with people and use capital W up here referring to Jesus Christ as the perfect word. And down here, you drop it down to the lowercase w. And then you go back to using capital W out throughout to, to make people think that you believe in the infallible word of God, capital W, when in reality, you're just referring to Jesus Christ being infallible to cover your hide. Here he says, House Church leader Steve Atkerson also holds a heretical view of Scripture. He exalts church, church tradition to the place of authority alongside of Scripture. So do you, David Cloud. So do you. What are you talking about? The doctrine of Scripture is a fundamental doctrine, and those who err in this cannot be trusted on any other point. They will throw the book out. Because you don't believe there in what you just wrote. The doctrine of Scripture is a fundamental doctrine, and those who err in this cannot be trusted on any other point. You just destroyed your whole ministry, David Cloud. Whole thing, right out the door. You don't believe this is the inspired Word of God? No, you don't. We're going to see about that later. Here he says, heresy pertaining to the stand for doctrinal purity. This is page 59. We have already seen that the house church movement is ecumenical. 
Okay, the whole house church movement is ecumenical. You know, notice he didn't say here that parts of the house church movement is ecumenical. He didn't say earlier parts of the house church movement is satanic. Well, no, he ain't going to say that. He's just going to throw the whole thing out and say the house church movement is satanic. The house church movement is ecumenical. I'm not ecumenical. A lot of my brothers and sisters out there that worship at home, they're not ecumenical. Who are you talking about, David Cloud? Down here, page 61, he says, We are to mark and avoid them which teach contrary to apostolic doctrine. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Hello, David Cloud. That's what I'm doing right now. I mean, I'll grant you, this book is filled with heresy and satanic nonsense and all kinds of charismatic kookiness and new age philosophy and whatever else. Frank Viola and his other books still. This is bad. But yours isn't much better, David Cloud. You're lying just as much as he did. A different form of lying. Yours is conservative lying. His is liberal lying. Over here we read, page 62. Further, it is typical for house churches not to have doctrinal statements, but they consider because they consider these to be divisive. No differentiation between the liberals and the conservative house churches. You can go to my website, you can go to our old, you know, Bible Believers Fellowship website and look at our doctrinal statement. Quite offensive to the lost world. We're not afraid, we're not afraid to, you know, what's he say there, to be divisive. Heresy pertaining to the return of Christ. The vast percentage of house church leaders reject the pre-tribulation rapture. Again, another lie. All right, I don't reject it, the pre-trib rapture. Again, you know, you're you're painting all house churches because of these wacky, wacky, wicked liberals over here. I, you know, again, I can use these arguments right back against you, David Cloud. I mean, I can say the majority of church buildings out there are are putting CCM in. They have the traditional, they have the contemporary service. The vast majority of them do it. And I'd be right, by the way, too, there. But the point is, can I, can I condemn all IFB Babel buildings out there and say you're all CCM because the others do CCM? No. You might not be CCM, but you know, you're doing things that are contrary to Scripture with your Babel building. You know, but you'd cry foul if I did that. If I blamed you for being CCM when because other Babel buildings do it, you know, You'd say, well, that's not fair. That's an unfair, you know, you're brush stroking all of us because of the, the few bad ones. But you're doing it with the house church movement. Hypocrisy. Page 69. Authoritative preaching is widely rejected within the house church movement. Nonsense. Page 70. Along this same line, Viola and Barna claim that the pulpit itself is pagan, which is nonsense. The pulpit is simply a lectern for preaching and teaching. In a Bible-believing church, the pulpit does not exalt a man. It exalts the Word of God, there we go again with the capital W, that the man is preaching. That's not true. You know it's not true. You read a book about it. Although I guess, you know, First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana is not a Bible-believing church, church according to your standards. You know, but check this out. Down here he says, in a Bible-believing church, the pulpit does not exalt a man. It exalts the Word of God that the man is preaching. This guy does this all the time. He, he writes something like that, and then he contradicts himself one paragraph later. Look at this. You see it there? Next page. Next paragraph. The God-called preacher who is proclaiming the Bible faithfully is God's mouthpiece, and it is wise to honor this position and activity in the house of God. Are you kidding me? What is the house of God? The, ba the Babel building there? The building? Over here he says, you know, we're not exalting, you know, Bible-believing church, the pulpit doesn't exalt a man. Over here he says, this guy's God's mouthpiece and it is wise to honor this position. Are you losing your mind, David Cloud? I mean, you can't even tell the truth within one paragraph. You're coming out and contradicting yourself. Page 73. The professing believer actually becomes his own God even while professing to be submitted to Christ as head. What end time confusion. You know, well, again, you're kind of condemning your own self there, David Cloud, because you see, if you have no higher authority on this earth than yourself, you don't believe this is your higher authority. 
because it's not the capital W Word of God, you see. You know, and you would never say that this is the inspired Word of God, the King James Bible. Then who is your God? What is your standard? You are. What end time confusion? I agree. You're the one that's confused. In the 1990s, Frank Viola attended the Laughing Drunken Slaying Revivals in Toronto, Pensacola, Lakeland, and Mel, Mel, or Melbourne. Excuse me. And um, question there, David Cloud. Where were those revivals held at? In people's private homes? No, they were held in large Babel buildings and open sports stadiums. They weren't held in small groups of believers where there's much greater accountability and multiple elders. They weren't held there. Large groups of people, Bible buildings. Maybe it'll sink through the old skull there eventually. Page 77. It is evident that those who associate with the house church movement can easily come into contact with this heresy and with the heretical apostles and prophets that promote it. Okay. So over here, he's talking about these massive revivals that were happening, obviously, in the open air, big, huge stadium things and, and in the big, huge Babel buildings. But if you're in a house church, you're going to run into these people. Huh? So again, let's contradict ourselves within a few paragraphs here. The end time revivals are wicked because they're in the, in the big Babel buildings and they do all this wicked stuff there. But they need the huge numbers. They need the huge amounts of money coming in to be able to perform these things. And if you go to a house church, you're probably going to run into those people. Down here he says, The rise of the new apostles and prophets is also closely associated with the house church movement. As we have seen, many of the house churches are networked together with, under the direction of apostles. Well, then why were you quoting these big revivals where these charismaniac apostles and stuff like that are deceiving people in buildings? Page 78. Obviously, a large number of house churches hold the principle that apostles continue to operate. Obviously. Obviously. Uh, yeah, sure. No proof given, of course. You know, I mean, footnotes down there? Of course not. We're dealing with opinions here. The issue of continuing prophets and apostles and is an issue of Pentecostal charismatic heresy. I got a question. Where do most Pentecostals and charismatics meet? In Babel buildings. Just insane. Down here he says, The Pentecostal apostles are self-deceived imposters who are building the end-time harlot church. <laughs> Okay, um, and how are they building it? By private, disorganized people meeting in their homes? Or by multi-million dollar, big, huge buildings drawing in all the people? A misunderstanding of the kingdom of God is a foundational error that permeates the house church movement. All of us are just heretics. We're all just so deceived, aren't we? Page 81. There is no pattern in the New Testament for a Christian nation. There is a pattern for the church. Okay, David Cloud. And what is the pattern for a church? Here we go. Page 82. Next page. The theme of latter rain Pentecostal kingdom building runs perhaps even more widely within the house church movement. Don't you love how sure of himself he is there? Perhaps it's even more widely within the house church movement. Perhaps. Uh, wrong again. I guarantee you the end time apostasy is going on more strongly in the big huge buildings than it is in the house church movement. Even taking the most wicked groups that follow this kind of junk over here, this Frank Viola nonsense, even these people, they don't have near the impact as the big Huge Rick Warren and Joe Osteen and all these other guys. Here we have page 87. If the house church movement is truly intent on building the kingdom of God today, they should be wielding this rod. Sure. Right. To 
you take Luke 17, verses 20 through 21, which is a relatively obscure passage, use it to overthrow the teaching of many plain scriptures, is upside down hermeneutics. This is the way that false teachers misuse the Bible. <laughs> kind of like saying, you know, I can take a verse or two and disprove all the verses that talk about people meeting in homes, meeting out in public and things like this. I can take a verse or two and try to twist it and, you know, that'd be, you know, misusing the Bible, an obscure passage. Sure it would. Page 90. Uh, he's talking about this Holy Ghost bartender guy, this Rodney Howard Brown and all these crazy nuts and stuff like this, and Frank Viola is all for this. He had to be hauled out of church in a wheelbarrow. Wait a second. I thought it was the house church people, the people that are meeting in home fellowships that are bringing in the end times church. What was this wicked guy doing in a Babel building? Yeah. Yeah. 